Welcome to a live stream service. There's going to be glitches. There's going to be troubles. In this world, you're going to have trials. You're going to have tribulation. You're going to have problems. And this is the internet. You know, it's full of trouble. And uh, as Job says, uh, man's days are uh, short and full of trouble. And we are certainly experiencing, you know, days full of trouble. <clears throat> so um, today we're going to talk about the rapture of the sovereign king. We've been looking at um, many passages of Scripture that deal with the sovereignty of the King of Kings. We've been looking at many different aspects. And as we've been doing so, last week we talked about the sovereign majestic king as he rode in on the donkey. A few, a few weeks ago we were talking about his triumphal entry and then the, the suffering servant that came in that rode in on the donkey. On, you know, we talked about Resurrection Day, that he laid down his life his rights to the world, his rights to the authority of all of the earth. And we talked about the sovereign majestic king coming in on a donkey, on the colt, the foal of a donkey. And we see that he laid down all of his rights, all of his authority. He made himself low. He came in as the suffering servant. He died in the most extreme contempt that can be imagined. He came to Jerusalem to die as the Lamb of God. And we see in the scripture that he is recorded in his genealogy to be the, the, a direct descendant of King David, that he is the son of David. He is heir to the throne. And yet he did not think of it as something that he needed to grab a hold of and maintain and hold on to. As the heir to the throne, he willingly laid down all his right, all his rule, and all of his power so that he could do something greater. Jesus promised that his day would come, though. His day was not when he rode in and they did a half-hearted coronation of the King of Kings. <clears throat> it wasn't a day, it wasn't the day when he came in and they said, Hosanna to the, the, the Lord, the Messiah, Hosanna, the blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. You know, it wasn't that that false coronation, that half-hearted effort. They wanted him to, they wanted to see if he was the Messiah. They were going to praise him and, and worship him in some exalted way. He promised that when his day came, everyone would see it and no one would escape from that day. Jesus promised that his day would not come before his humiliation. And we've read that. We'll read it again. And then we saw that there was a veiled promise from Genesis. Last week we talked about this veiled promise from Genesis, that after his humilia humiliation on the cross, he would rise again. Genesis 3.15, for example, speaks of the promise of the Redeemer that he would be bruised on the heel of Satan, that serpent, and Satan would be crushed in the head and finally defeated, that sin and death itself would be defeated. Isaiah 53 speaks of the Messiah being bruised and crushed, rejected by God, rejected of men, not esteemed, not loved. He had no form, no comeliness that we should want to be with him, want to be identified with him. We esteemed him smitten and stricken of God and afflicted. And he bore those griefs for our iniquity. Then the Messiah would see the suffering, the, the reward of his sufferings. We see that in Isaiah 53. The prophets and even Jesus himself revealing more and more in progressive revelation that the Messiah would suffer and die and then he would rise before his day would be fulfilled. He would rise into the heavens. The prophets told this. Jesus promised this before his day was fulfilled. Today, we're going to talk about a wonderful moment, a wonderful promise found in the passages of Scripture that deal with the rapture of the coming king. It's a controversial subject. You know, some people say, no, it won't ever happen. Some people say it happens in different ways. We're in a prolonged look at these promises because they're important. As we deal with Jesus answering his disciples and the Pharisees when they asked him about the coming king. The coming kingdom. In Luke 17, we see this. 
in verse 20, it sets the stage of this great study. Being asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, he answered them, The kingdom of God is not coming in ways that can be observed. Nor will you say, Look, here he is, or, or here it is, and, or there, for behold, the kingdom of God is in the midst of you. And we looked at that in detail. The fact that the, the Lord comes to be with you and be inside of you. It's the, the spiritual birth of the kingdom of God that, that starts from Jesus Christ, that, that mustard seed that starts from Christ dying. And then as he died, he raises up the kingdom through spiritual faith. The Pharisees and all of the people of Israel, they believed, well, let's say a vast majority. Maybe we won't want to say all. But the vast majority believed that the kingdom of God was to come, that the Messiah was going to bring in the kingdom. They were premillennial. They believed the Messiah was going to come in. He was going to conquer the whole entire uh, Roman system, take over the Jewish system, conquer the entire uh, world for the glory of God and for the sake of Israel. They believed that he was going to establish the kingdom. He was going to establish and reestablish the promised throne of David, and it would be eternal upon the earth. They were premillennial. This was the reason they asked the question. They asked the question because they believed that he was going to come back. They didn't believe that he was the sovereign one to come, but if he was, they were going to be on his side. And if he was not, he would die, and they would carry on as the re religious uh, leaders and rulers. They understood that the Messiah would come and bring in his earthly kingdom. The Pharisees did not see a suffering Savior in the Scripture. They didn't see the, the Isaiah 53 and the other passages. They didn't see the Messiah coming to bear sin and bear iniquity because they didn't think they had such. They didn't see anything except the establishment of the throne of David, and the eternal bodily reign of the Son of David. They saw that that would happen and the Messiah would be, be the one that would bring in that rule and that reign. They missed everything in between. Many others have as well. There are many people who have, have missed it because they've been so distracted with the things of the world and with their own ways and not paying attention to what was going on in front of them. Not going on, not paying attention to the very scripture that God places before them because they have so much other things going on in their lives that they could care less about what the Word of God is saying. Either that or they don't understand what the Word of God is saying. Some could care less and they want it to be their own way, others care deeply and yet they don't understand. And because they want things to be done in their way, they they allegorize scripture because they can't see it being done any other way. For example, maybe you guys remember this happening in about 2011. You know, Jesus gave solid teaching about this long stretch of false messiahs and false predictions about Jesus' coming. He says to us, there will be times when people will say, here is Christ, or there he is, there's the kingdom, there's, there's the, the Messiah, there's the Christ, there's the kingdom, it's come over here and look over there. Remember that Harold Camping, and this is just one example, he comes in and he gives a failed prophecy, a, a failed proclamation of the Messiah that was going to come, and people were in panic mode. You had Christians that were scared to death to even say, no, I don't believe this is going to come, because they thought if they said they didn't believe it, that, that he was going to give us an exact date, that if, if, if we didn't believe it, that we weren't Christian, or that we would miss it. Jesus lays out with strong truth, and a strong truth that needs to be proclaimed and unfolded and unpacked about his second coming. And make no mistake, the passages we're looking at deal with his second coming, with his coming in glory, his coming to bring wrath. And we need to look at that. It's not unclear, but it doesn't fit the agenda of many of the professing world. So they make what is clear unclear. They try to hide and veil that mystery that, that Paul talks about. But it's also seen here. Verse 26 
says, just as it was in the days of Noah, so it will, will be in the days of the Son of Man. They were eating and drinking and marrying and being given in marriage until the day when Noah entered the, entered the ark. <clears throat> Excuse me, sorry. And the flood came and destroyed them all. Likewise, just as it was in the days of Lot, they were eating and drinking, buying and selling, planting and building. But on the day when, the, when Lot went out of Sodom, fire and sulfur rained from heaven and destroyed them all. In verse 30, so will it be on the day when the Son of Man is revealed. On that day, let the one who is in the housetop with his goods in his house not come down to take them away. And likewise, let the one who is in the field not turn back. Verse 32 says, Remember Lot's wife. Whoever seeks to preserve his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life will keep it. I tell you, in that night, there will be two in one bed. One will be taken and the other left. There will be two women grinding together. One will be taken and the other left. The NASB uh, has uh, verse 36 in it as well. It says, two men will be in one field or in the field. One will be taken and the other will be left. Verse 37, and they said to him, where, Lord? And he said, where the corpse is, there the vultures will be gathered. Brothers and sisters, as Christians, we believe in the promise that the Lord is going to return bodily on this earth, to this earth, to be King of kings and Lord of lords. Now, there are many people that believe this to happen in different ways, okay? There's all kinds of different ideas. You know, some people believe in, in uh, what, would be, what would be called a, uh, a premillennialism. Others believe... And I guess you would call it post-millennialism. And then there's another set believe in ah-millennialism. Just so you understand, pre-millennialism, it comes... I mean, there are so many different teachings and different ways of seeing this. Pre-millennialism has two different understandings. We have two different beliefs in this. The historic pre-mill and the dispensational pre-millennialism. Then you also have the, the leaky dispensational, and that would be the partial... Um, or the, say, let's say the progressive dispensational. You have, you, have this, you have all kinds of different ideas in here. Premillennialism says that Christ will come to earth before the millennial kingdom and he will come for his bride. That's dispensational premillennialism. And he himself will establish his kingdom upon the earth. Postmillennialism, just as a general overview, says that Jesus will come after the, the Christians have established God's kingdom here on earth. They're going to establish it for him, and that at some, some, some time, some body or some group of the church is going to bring and present the keys to the kingdom to the Lord whenever the, you know, this event has happened, that, that all the earth has come under subjection of Christ and the Lord comes and the, the church, the body of Christ, has taken over the world, and they have established the kingdom of God on earth. Amillennial, amillennialism says that there, there will not be a millennial kingdom. There is no thousand years as spoken of in the scripture. There is no millennial kingdom. There is no millennial reign. There is no reign upon the earth. At an appointed time, everyone is raptured into heaven to the great white throne, the goats and the sheep are taken and separated out, and they are judged by Almighty God. Those passages of Scripture that talk to us about the rapture are not unclear. But if you will take a moment and look with me in Luke 17, I believe you're going to see another thing that's not unclear. These are clearly promised in the Word of God that the Lord's day of vengeance and wrath is coming. In Luke 17, 26 to 37, we all agree that the Bible says that there is coming a day when the wrath of God is going to be poured out for all who would not believe. For all unbelievers, we believe that. And Jesus himself points to the fact 
that just as it is in the days of Noah, so it will be in the days of the Son of Man. In the same way, likewise, verse 28, as it was in the days of Lot, so it will be when the Son of Man comes. The Son of Man or the day of the Lord is the idea of the time when the Lord comes to exercise justice and judgment, and it is not just one particular day. We understand that there is an unfolding of the wrath of God, an unveiling of the wrath of God. We don't know how long it will take, but we know it will take a long time. But these passages that are foreshadowing the promise and the culmination of a final judgment from Almighty God when He judges all the wicked on the earth, these passages are also foreshadowing another event that you can see here in this passage if you will look at it. Now, this is just the, the lowest rungs of the truth of the Scripture when it comes to the rapture, when it comes to the catching away or the pulling away that God has. We see it in God's progressive revelation as he teaches. In Luke 17, Jesus says, just as it was in the days of Noah, just as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be on the days of the Son of Man. Now listen to what's being said. Jesus states in the Greek, kathos genamai. It means exactly as it was in the days of Noah, exactly in the same way as it was in Noah's day, exactly in the same way as it was in Lot's time. What happened in Lot's time? What happened in Noah's time? In the days of Noah, so it will be on the days of the Son of Man. And Jesus states, the general setting of the world in a pre-wrath flood, before this great wrath that comes upon the world, Jesus states that they were eating and drinking and they were marrying and given in marriage. Now, it doesn't sound that bad, does it? They were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage. You mean to tell me that God's going to come and destroy the whole world and he's going to exercise wrath and justice just because they were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage? Does that all that means? Is that possibly all he's saying? Or, or do we have to go back and look and see the full context of what's being said? Then Jesus says that what they were doing, that all they were doing, let me say that again. Then Jesus says that they were doing all this until Noah entered the ark. Until the day that Noah entered the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. The flood came. The wrath of the flood came and it destroyed the entire world and everyone in it. Except for those who were in the ark. Except for those who were believers of faith and brought into the ark. They found their salvation their, their, from the very pre-wrath flood of Almighty God upon the entire world. They found their salvation in the ark. Verse 28 says, Just like the wrath that came on the world during Noah, there would be a wrath that fell, up, fell upon Sodom. And what were they doing pre-wrath? They were eating and drinking. They were buying and selling. Before the wrath of Almighty God that was poured out upon those people, Sodom and Gomorrah, the wickedness of them, was that they were eating and drinking, buying and selling again. Does that sound like what we're hearing the full extent of what's going on? He gives a general overview of the idea of the world. But in both cases, when was the wrath of God poured out upon the wicked? Look with me again. In verse 27... In both cases, in verse 27, it speaks to the flood of Noah, and Jesus says in verse 27 that they were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage. They were living their lives completely impervious or immune to any thought of God, any things of God. <clears throat> they were doing life their own way. They were living under their own counsel and their own wisdom. And yet we, see, we will see in a minute that they were doing so much more. But it says that Jesus proclaims until the day when Noah entered the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. Brothers and sisters, listen. 
they were living their lives impervious to the idea and the thought that the wrath of God would come. They were completely oblivious and they did not care. They lay around sleeping and not paying attention. They lay around eating and drinking and not paying attention. They would not focus their hearts and their minds and their sight upon God, but they lived their lives in their own bubble, in their own vanity, in their own desires, in their own lusts. The lust of the eye and the lust of flesh and the pride of life. Likewise, just as it was in the days of Lot, they were eating and drinking and buying and selling. The others were eating and drinking and being given in marriage. They were eating and drinking and buying and selling. They were planting and they were building. But on the day when Lot went out of Sodom, fire and sulfur rained from heaven and destroyed them all. You hear about Sodom and Gomorrah. The wrath of God was not poured out upon the wicked in both of those cases until God had saved his few believers from the absolute devastation, the total wiping out of his own, by his own personal divine judgment. They were under persecution. They were living in trial and tribulation and temptation. They were living in that world. They were living under the, the wickedness and the depravity of the world. They were, they were part of it. They were experiencing life until the day that the Lord came and pulled them out. Pulled them out of the wrath of Almighty God. Pulled them out of the judgment and the justice of Almighty God and saved them from that day. We are told that we will not undergo those persecutions. They faced this world and those struggles until the day that the Lord himself pulled his people out. They weren't given a protective bubble. Think about this. Every Christian, every believer, every believer today, we go under the wrath of the world. We go under the wickedness of the world. We are persecuted all the day long. You know, even with this corona and the COVID thing going on, we see that there are Christians being told that they cannot meet together and they cannot come together. They, they cannot worship together face to face. And, and if they come together and sit in a parking lot in a car, they can be arrested and charged. And one governor saying, if you do it again, we'll give you a felony because you're sitting in a car. But you can go to any restaurant or any Walmart or anywhere else and sit in a car line and pick up food or go to Walmart and pick up whatever you want to pick up sit there, shake hands, talk to each other, and everything else. And they say, oh, social distance, but you don't see it in the world. But you see the demand of social distance where? In the body of Christ. You don't see it in the world, but you see it in the body of Christ because nobody wants Christians to be together. Now think about this. We are under persecution in smallest amounts possible today. But maybe it gets greater and greater because there used to be a time when, people, when Christians were beheaded and you know, tore asunder and, depart, and you know, completely ripped apart and put in prison. And you know, the scripture records of all the things that happened to the, the, the diaspora saints that they were you know, ran out from Nero. And he says that all of the wickednesses that went on in Nero's time, that there was depravity upon depravity and wickedness upon wickedness. And this has happened ever since the day Christ proclaimed his kingdom on the earth. It has never stopped and it never will stop until the day that the Lord comes in and he stomps his foot down on earth. We see this constantly and have always seen that the true people of God, even in Israel, were always the people of suffering. They were always persecuted. No matter who they were, true believers were always reviled because Christ said, they hated me first and they will hate you. You won't escape. This is not escapism. Okay? When, when God put Noah in the ark, was that escapism? People charge the rapture idea that, that, oh, that's escapism. Well, God put Noah in the ark before what? The flood. Before there was a destruction, a wrath of God poured out in all the world. And the, the world couldn't see it. They wouldn't see it, even though it was proclaimed. You and I, Christian, today are proclaiming sin, righteousness, and what? Judgment to come. We are telling the world that there is coming a day when God in judgment will absolutely wipe out this planet in his wrath and in his justice. The Bible says it will all be burnt up with fire. 
the heavens, the earth, and everything, and the only thing will be left is the great white throne, and God in his justice and his judgment will take every single person who has not believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, and they will be judged for everything they've ever done. And we tell people, put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? We tell people, put on Christ and flee from the wrath to come. Flee from the judgment to come because it's real. Now think about what Noah was doing. He wasn't just telling people, it's not good for you to eat gluten, or it's not good for you to eat this thing, or that thing, or the meat, or this, that, and the other. He wasn't saying, oh, you're drinking wine, oh, you're doing this. He wasn't saying that. He was saying, you are living in wickedness, and the wrath of God is coming. It is going to rain. We tell people today that the Lord Jesus Christ is coming in his glory, and when he comes, the wrath of God will be poured out. Maybe you won't see that day. Maybe you'll see the day when you die, just like everyone else, for it's appointed for man wants to die. But after that comes the judgment. Maybe you see that day. Or maybe you get to live long enough to see Christ return for his church and for all of the, the tribulation and the, the wickedness to, to be poured out upon the earth. We see here that Jesus says, until the day when Noah entered the ark, they were living their lives perpetually for 1,500 years. They were living their lives in defiance of Almighty God. Lot, in his case, they, these people were living their lives. They were buying and selling. They were eating and drinking. They were buying what? They were selling what? Flesh. They were buying flesh. They had, they had the right to buy people for for purposes of sexual deviancy and they would sell people for the purpose of sexual deviancy and the wickedness and they were planting and living their normal lives and they were building bigger and bigger kingdoms because they lived for themselves. This is not an example of escapism. This example, it didn't escape Paul either. 2 Peter 2.15 I'm sorry, 2 Peter 2, 5 through 9. It didn't escape uh, Peter as well. He says this, talking about Noah. If he did not spare the ancient world, but preserved Noah, a herald of righteousness. Now, some people say he preached righteous, righteousness for 120 years. What I will tell you for a fact is, is that he preached righteousness from the moment that God said, you're going to build an ark and I'm going to destroy the world with a flood until the day that the doors were closed. He was a preacher of righteousness. With seven others, they proclaimed the truth of God. And when he brought a flood upon the world of the ungodly, If by turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to ashes, he condemned them to extinction, making them an example, so that, so, so, uh, example of what is going to happen to the ungodly. And if he rescued righteous Lot, so he goes from Noah to Lot and he says this, and if he rescued righteous Lot, that's escapism, if he rescued righteous Lot, Greatly distressed by the sensual conduct of the wicked. Now, here's, here's one thing I want to add in as a free footnote to think about. Listen to this. Righteous lot. You look in the Old Testament and you think wicked lot, vile lot, sinful lot, false convert lot. And Peter, by the power of the Holy Spirit, under the inspiration of the Word of God, of God the Word, says that rot, lot was righteous. And his soul was vexed under the wickedness of that city. If he rescued righteous Lot, who's greatly distressed by the sensual conduct of the wicked, for as, as, for as that righteous man lived among them day after day, he was tormented his righteous, he was tormenting his righteous soul over their lawless deeds that he saw and heard. That is us, brothers and sisters, as we are tormented by the wickedness of the world. 
If you are not today tormented by the wickedness of the abortion industry and the murder mills and the, 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 the great high leaders and teachers and the, the, the Hollywood elite telling you about how it's, it's your civil right and it's your right to murder babies and, to, and it's the American way to rip to shreds babies so that you can have your best life now. If that is not vexing your soul, you're not saved. You need to get right with Almighty God. Listen to this. Their souls were vexed by the wickedness. If the porn industry and the sinful industry and the LGBTQ and all of the transsexual and pansexual and all the sexual deviancies, if those don't cause your soul to be vexed, check your heart. Listen to this. This man was tormented day and night. And verse 9 says, If the Lord knows how to spare Noah and Sodom, um, Noah and Lot, listen to verse 9, then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trials and to keep the unrighteous under punishment until the day of judgment. Let's look at the argument for the rapture. We're to look at the lesser to the greater. Looking at the lesser to the greater, just for a short time, as we talk about these, we've already seen that Jesus has already started speaking from that. Starting in Genesis, though, we look in Genesis 5, 21. When Enoch had lived 65 years, he fathered Methuselah. Before the flood, before the wrath, Enoch walks with God. After he fathers Methuselah, he walks with God for 300 years. He had sons and daughters. For 300 years, and his days of Enoch were 365 years. And listen to what it says in 24. And Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. We see that this is a case of the snatching away of Enoch. God took him from the earth. He took him bodily, living from the earth. He did not die in any such way. He did not lay down. You see before, John MacArthur points out that before this, you have generation after generation after generation of, and he died, and he died, and he died, and he died. He, he was born of this one. He had this many years, and he died. And all of a sudden, right in the midst, you have the tale of Enoch. There are many who are born and born and born and die and die and die. And then Enoch comes along and he walks with God and then he was gone because God took him. He did not die. God took him. <clears throat> before the wrath, before the flood. In 2 Kings 2, 9 to 12, I love the story. I love Elijah. I love listening to the story of Elijah and Elisha or Elisha. Uh, the, listen to this. Here, Elijah is telling his disciple, his young, his young learner that he's coming with him. He is, he's telling him that he is about to be taken up. He says, I am about to be taken away. And all the people are, are hearing this and they know that he is about to leave them. <clears throat> Elijah said to Elisha, Ask what I shall do for you before I am taken from you. Listen to that. Before I leave. Before I'm taken away. Before I'm snatched away from you. And Elisha said, please, let there be a double portion of your spirit upon me. By the way, there was. If you go look, the things that Elijah did, Elisha did double. <clears throat> there was a, he says in verse 10, you have asked a hard thing, yet if you see me as I am being taken from you, not as I'm being dropped down in the ground to die, not as I'm being laid down because something's happened to me and I'm laid down into the tomb and they cover me with dirt, but as I am taken up, as I am taken up to into the clouds, into the heavens, if you see me into the heavens, if you see me go into the heavens, if you see me, it will be done for you, but if you do not see me, it shall not be done so. In verse 11, we see this. And as they still went on talking, as they were in the midst of the conversation, 
having that, that conversation that you and I are having today, that conversation that we have all the time with people, just the, the conversations of life, and they're going on and talking about the things that are going on, and they're, they're talking about the problems of the world, and they're talking about the blessings to come. They're talking about the fact that, yes, we're going to die one day. We're going to meet God. But this case, he's saying, I'm not going to die. I'm going to be taken. He knows he's about to be taken. And in this case, as he's saying this, listen, verse 12. Well, let's verse 11. And as they still went on talking, behold, chariots of fire and horses of fire separated the two of them. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind into where? What does it say? It says heaven. He didn't go down into the ground. He went bodily into heaven. And Elisha saw it and he said, he cried, My father, my father, the chariots of Israel and his horsemen. And he saw him no more. Then he took hold of his own clothes and tore them into two pieces. These are the two strongest cases of the Old Testament of rapture, whereby God takes his saints alive to be with him in the air. To be with him. In all the other cases, we see that you know they, they, the idea of Sheol or paradise, that, that the, the dead in Christ, the dead believers, the dead who are from Adam onward up until Christ were taken to a place of, dead, of the dead called Sheol, called paradise. There's one idea of Sheol, which is hell, and one idea of Sheol, which is paradise, a place of, of peace and waiting and for the Lord to open the kingdom of heaven and op open the gates of heaven when he, in his living body, will bring captivity captive and he will bring those who are under, under the, the, the curse of death and under the weight of death, waiting in paradise to be with God forever in their, in their spiritual bodies. Now listen, listen closely. This will happen. In the New Testament, we see that Jesus Christ is the greatest example of the ascended Lord, of the ascended living person, the living body, Jesus himself, talking about his ascension. No Christian disputes the bodily ascension of the living Jesus. At least not that I know of. Maybe there are some heretical group that says, no, he didn't go up to heaven, and no, he didn't really come to life. No, he wasn't really uh, brought back into heaven, uh, taken back up into heaven. Jesus says no one ascends to the Father except for the one that came down. He came down from heaven, and he went back up to heaven. He came down in spirit to indwell Mary and became a living being. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God in John. And we later we find out, and the Word became flesh. And upon his resurrection, after some days being with the people, what did he say? Mark 16, 19. So then the Lord Jesus, after he had spoken to them, was taken up into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God. Next week we're going to flesh that part out. But listen to this. Verse Luke 24, 50 uh, to 51 says, Then he led them out as far as Bethany and lifted up his hands and blessed them. And while he blessed them, he parted from them and was carried into heaven. He ascended. He went away. He was taken up. He was snatched away. John 16, 28 I came from the Father, and I have come into the world, and now I am leaving the world and going to the Father. How did he leave? He died on the cross. He was buried, and three days later he rose again, and then he was taken up into the heavens. John twenty seventeen, Jesus said to her, Do not cling to me, for I have not ascended to the Father. But go to your brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. The God of all creation says that he is about to ascend into heaven. Acts 1.9, and when he had said these things, oops, did I put it on there? Acts 1.9, thank you, I apologize for that. 
Acts 1 9. And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. The angel said, Why are you standing here watching? Don't you know that the one that has has risen up this one he has go, he is going to come back in the same way that he came in the clouds let's see if i can pull this one up as well listen to that one paul the apostle believed it so much it changed everything about him and he says you know this is the confession of truth that he says every believer must hold to. Great indeed is our confession. Great indeed is the mystery of godliness. We confess is the mystery of godliness. That Jesus, he was manifest in the flesh, vindicated by the Spirit, seen by the angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the world and taken up in the glory. He was, he was taken up in the glory. We hold these confessions to be truth. Don't deny them. Don't deny them as if there's some vague promise, some veiled reality, or some veiled mystery that's not true, that you have to change and allegorize. We have to believe. And we have to believe that Jesus Christ is the risen Savior, and He has ascended, and He is seated at the heavenly throne of Almighty God at the right hand of Almighty God and that one day he will come and he will bring his bride with him and he will establish his kingdom and his authority upon the earth. But we also must believe that there is coming, as the Lord's promised, a very real time of the day of the wrath of Almighty God. That is coming. In our text, in Luke 17, Jesus deals specifically with Noah and Lot. I want to look quickly at that. In verse uh, in, in Genesis chapter 6, 8, we're going to start there. Now think about this. I want to set the stage quickly, okay? The Lord saw the wickedness on the earth. It was great. The world was wicked, great in its wickedness. And, and he determined that he was going to destroy all life. They gave themselves over to every form of debauchery and wickedness and vileness and sin, and they made everything marriage. It sounds kind of like today. I'm not trying to give you a calendar, so nobody worry about it. I'm not giving you a calendar that the Lord's going to return on such and such day. But it kind of sounds like we are seeing today. And the scripture tells us about the birth pains for when the Lord's going to return. And those birth pains come slowly, and they start to build up. And as you see, they start to build up eventually. When birth happens, what happens, Mom? There is no stopping it. It's going to happen, right? It's going to happen, and there's nothing to stop it. When it's time, it's time. But we see here that for, for thousand, a thousand plus years, they gave themselves over to every form of debauchery, and they finally gave themselves over to demons, to being intermarried with demons. They even had children with these demons and spawned evil upon evil. For some way, they were, they were capable either through demonic possession or the actual activity. I don't know, and I don't want to know, but I don't want to be there when it happens. But l let me tell you something. For those of you that are sitting there saying, is the Lord turn coming back now? Is he going to come back now? What about the rapture? Um, brothers and sisters, you look at this model and you see that Jesus says, talking about his, his, the day of his wrath and the judgment of Almighty God and all of those things being poured out, that before he returns, all of this wickedness, this type of vileness will be going on. And while we've seen it bad, we haven't seen it like this yet. We have not seen it this way, that all the world was always in their heart, every thought was to do either, evil. Even with all of that detestable wickedness, God determines to destroy the earth. And in Genesis 6, 8, but Noah found favor in the sight of the Lord. Why? Was he sinless? No. Was he perfect? No. But he believed God and it was accounted to him. It was given to him as righteousness. We find out that Noah was a preacher of righteousness as we saw in 2 Peter. In Genesis 7, 11, in the 600th year, 600th year of Noah's life, 
in the second month, in the seventeenth day of the month, on that day, all of the fountains of the great deep burst forth, and the windows of heaven were opened. Now, if you look in verse 15, you'll see this. They went into the ark with Noah. He had proclaimed righteousness all of the time that they were building the ark. He had proclaimed, it is going to rain. The wrath of God is coming. The flood is coming, and there will be no escape. That The day of the Lord and His wrath is coming, and there will be no escape. Believe me, you do not want to face Almighty God on that day. And they said, yeah, right. We've seen the stars. We know that there is no one that's made anything. We know that the demons have power and Satan has power. And we know that all these things have power. We have power and we are our own gods. And we can do whatever we want to. Look at all the things we can do. All of the vile, wicked imaginations of our heart are fulfilled. And anything we want, we can have. And in verse 11, God opens the windows up. And in verse 15, listen to this. They went into the ark with Noah, two by two, of all flesh in which there was the breath of life. And those who entered, male and female, of all flesh, went in as God had commanded them. Listen to me. Creation obeys God's command. But man, full of wickedness and sin, will not obey. And only the righteous of God, only those called out by God, are in the ark, are in the ark today of Jesus Christ, are in Christ and saved from the very wrath of an almighty God. And on the day when God pours out his wrath, we find out that we will not be here. Listen, just going further. Noah is put in the ark with the animals. And then it says, And the Lord shut him in. Who was it that shut the door? Who was it that closed off the, the means of grace? Who was it that closed off mercy and blessing and grace and long-suffering? It was time for the Lord's wrath and justice to come. Wrath and judgment were abated until the day that they were safely on the ark. And when they were on the ark, God gave just a little space, and then he closed the door. In Luke 17, Jesus reveals that the wrath will come exactly like it did in the days of Noah and in the days of Lot. So looking at Lot, just quickly, in Genesis, the wickedness of Sodom and Gomorrah was so great that the Lord himself came down with his angels to judge those wicked people. And for the sake of Israel, for the sake of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and the family line, because Lot was a believer, because and that just blows my mind that he was a believer and he did the things he did, but Lot was a believer and his soul was vexed. God, in his great kindness, mercied Lot. In Genesis, the wicked of Sodom and Gomorrah, it is so great that he comes down to the city and he's going to wipe it clean. Today, there's not even a, a trace of Sodom and Gomorrah. Most people, or some people, should I say, they think that it's in the Dead Sea. Some people try to, try to place where it might be. But the Bible tells us that it's all is just turned into an ash heap, a pillar of salt. The entire community at that time, all of the men, apparently, even all the men involved, maybe even Lot's, uh, the husbands of Lot's daughters, were given over to homosexuality and the selling of people, the raping of others, and the buying of people, of men, to involve themselves with sexually and immorally. Maybe even the women as well. This is where you get the idea of sodomy. The sodomite. You know, today we try to dress it up and call it, well, you're just, you're just gay or you're homosexual. No, the Bible talks about sodomy and the sodomite and says no sodomite will enter the kingdom of heaven. So repent. No sexually immoral person will enter heaven. They saw the glorious angels who were sent in to bring Lot out and to bring judgment on the city. And the entire city wanted to rape the angels. 
So the angels blinded the men of the city, but they wouldn't stop there. And in verse 12, the angels tell Lot to get his family and the in-laws out of Sodom because the Lord had sent them to destroy the city. The Lord has sent them to destroy the city. In verse 15, the amazing thing, Lot just sits around and he waits. He, he just like, I, I, you know, I, I've got a little bit of time. Surely I've got other things to do. You know, it's not that pressing of an issue. He didn't understand what was happening. We have a lot of people today that don't see the coming of the Lord. But they don't see that God is pulling them out. They don't see it and they don't understand it. And, and Lot, he saw, he saw what was going on in, in the wickedness of the world, but he didn't understand the purpose of God. He didn't see those things. Lot just sits around, and he's not understanding the certainty of the coming wrath. The angels grabbed a hold of him, and they snatched him away. They grabbed him, and they pulled him out. But he lingered. So the men seized upon him, and his wife and the two daughters by the hand. They grabbed the wife and the two daughters and they grabbed him and they yanked him completely out. Even the ones who had been told the wrath is going to be poured out, they lingered. They didn't understand. The men seized them and they brought them out of the city. In verse 17, we, we, are, we see it clearly. And as they brought them out, one said, escape for your life. Don't look, look back. Don't stop anywhere in the valley. Escape to the hills, lest you be swept away. And of course, we know that Lot argues with the angels, and he wants to go to Zoar. So they let him go. Escape quickly, verse 22. Escape quickly, they tell him. For we can do nothing till you arrive there. Therefore, the name of the city was called Zoar. He says, he says, escape quickly because we cannot judge until you are safe. We cannot pour out wrath until you're safe. The angels could not pour out the wrath of God until the people of God were safe in the city. And then Jesus, if you go back to Luke, says this. Remember Lot's wife. What happened? The Lord rained down judgment on Sodom and Gomorrah, sulfur and fire, from the Lord out of heaven. He absolutely decimated the city and everything in it. Pre-wrath, he's crying out that there's judgment to come. He calls out for his people and he brings them out. And then we get a glimpse of this. Those that are truly not believers, that, are, that love the world more than they love God. But Lot's wife, behind him, looked back. And because she looked back, she became a pillar of salt. She wanted the things of the world. God had promised to deliver his people out from trials, from the day of God's wrath, from the vengeance of God's wrath. Him pouring out His justice and His judgment. And you don't see that many times in the Scriptures. But you see that in a few places in the Old Testament where God absolutely decimates either the entire world or cities under the very wrath of Almighty God when He decimates it as an illustration to show us, yes, there's judgment to come. How do we know this? Because Jesus said it. And in the same way, we will see the body of Christ, the people of Christ, taken out of here, taken out of the world. You're talking about the rapture? The church of Thessalonica, they were being inundated with people that were trying to make shipwreck of their faith. They were telling them that they had missed the resurrection and the return of Christ. They believed that Christ was going to come. They believed that there was a resurrection. Paul had told them and, and he tells them these promises, and people come in trying to make shipwreck of their faith. They've already missed it. They've missed the return of the Lord. They've missed all of it. Uh, uh, that, that the Lord has come already. Paul the Apostle then explains that Christ will appear in the clouds to call the dead in Christ first, then those who are in Christ who remain. We don't know when that's going to be, but it says that we'll all be caught up. 1 Thessalonians 4. 
But we do not want you to be ignorant, brothers, uninformed, about those who are asleep. That, that euphemism is they have died physically, but spiritually they're alive. That you may not grieve as others do who do not have hope. They're not still in the ground. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring them with, bring, bring him, will, I'm sorry, God will bring with him those who've fallen asleep. He's going to bring those with him who've fallen asleep. For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord. This is a, a, a revelation that comes that uh, to Paul, a revelation that came by a word of the Lord, that those who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. In other words, the dead who are sleeping in Christ will not... Let me say that the other way around. I'm sorry. Those who are alive who are in Christ today or whatever day this happens at the coming of the Lord. Those who are alive will not precede those who are dead. Those who are dead will be caught up to be with him. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with a cry of command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of Almighty God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together, that, that word caught up is the word harpazo. It's, it's the idea of something being taken forcefully. I'll, I'll give it to you in just a moment. But listen to this. It is the idea. Here it says, for the Lord himself, God himself, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, will himself descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of the archangel, of an archangel, and with the sound of the trump of God. And what will happen? The dead in Christ rise first. They come out of the grave. Their physical bodies come out of the grave to come up. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. I want you to think about the blessing of this promise. Paul the Apostle wants us to encourage, wants the Thessalonians to encourage each other. You haven't missed it. Paul wants to encourage us that you have not missed this day. You have not missed it. It has not been escaped you. But what will happen on the day, when the day at the day when the Lord will come back for his bride? I want you to notice that there is no judgment here. He says, I want you to encourage each other with this promise. These are the words of promise of the things that are to come. We will be caught up. It literally means in the Greek, harpazo, H-A-R-P-A-Z-O, to take something by force. One commentator says it's rapaciously to rip someone up, to pull one up to firmly, quickly yank them up and to bring them up to be with you. As we saw with Elijah, as we saw, I'm sorry, Ezekiel, as we saw with, with um, Enoch, and as we see with Jesus Christ himself, who, who went up and he led a, co a host captive that were captive. He led those dead saints, the spirits of those dead saints that were still in paradise as as was the, the, the thief on the cross who believed in Jesus. When Jesus says, today you'll be with me in paradise, he led him up to heaven for all eternity. And in this case, and in this case, he takes them back down. And where does he take them to? He takes them to a cloud. He, this is not him stepping his foot on the earth. This is him stepping his foot in the clouds. And everyone will see and everyone will hear that Jesus Christ with a loud shout, with the voice of the trumpet of Almighty God, with the voice of the trumpet will shout out. And from the four winds, all of God's people will be brought with him. All of the bride of Christ will be taken up with him. And we are called to encourage one another. Then those who are alive will be caught up together with them. With who? Those who were dead. Who were formerly dead. Who are we, where are we going to go to? Into the clouds with him to meet the Lord in the air. To be with him forever. 
Now, as I said a moment ago, there's no mention of Christ stepping his foot on the Mount of Olives here. He does that in the second coming. That'll be talking about the return of the sovereign king. That'll be talking about his second coming when he returns to establish his kingdom on his day. His day starts. His day starts at the moment that you see the the, the people being raptured out of the, the, the world. There is no sign for this event. This is a glorious event, and it's a signless event. It's just like it was in the days of Noah, exactly as it was in the days of Noah, when Noah, a preacher of righteousness, kept telling them it's going to rain, and there was a symbol for the world to understand this ark that was being built. And we have these symbols, these, these buildings all around the place, and, and these churches that are being... Uh, brought up even here on the internet that are being brought up for the world to see that we are telling people the wrath of God is coming. It's going to rain. Get in the ark of Jesus Christ. Because one day he is going to come and he's going to take his bride and he's going to bring us to be with him so that we can be where he is. Jesus made this promise to us and he told us that where he is we will be also. In, 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 uh, in 1 Corinthians 15, 50, listen to the promise of resurrection life in Christ. I tell you, brothers, I tell you this, brothers, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. You're going to die. Nor does the, imper or the perishable put on the imperishable. You are going to die, and you are going to put on an imperishable body. Behold, I tell you a mystery. A mystery, mysterion, is the idea of something that hasn't been known, not something that can't be known. Something that wasn't revealed and is now being revealed. He tells the Corinthians in one place, in this place, that you don't know and I'm giving you a mystery. In other places he says, all of you understand of the wrath of Almighty God, that the day of wrath will come. And in this case he says, there is a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we will all be changed. Every time I think about that, I think about the kids, the, the infant's room, the, the baby's room, where there's always a sign there that says that they'll, they'll not all sleep, but they'll all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, does that not tell you this very same thing that we just read? That at the last trump, the trump will sound and the dead in Christ will be raised imperishable. They can never die again. They've died once. They can never die again. And even though we will not all die, all those who are alive will see the Lord in the air and we will be with him. What a blessing. This mortal body is going to put on immortality. The great promise of God is that there will be a time when believers who are on the earth will see the Lord coming in clouds. Now, the, the warning here is, and the reason that so many people have said it's a secret rapture is because even Jesus himself says, when I return, will I even find faith on the earth? There must be an apostasy, a great apostasy. There has always been apostasy or falling away, but there must be a great apostasy. Remember that 2 Peter 2.9 says that that the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trials. You know, the Bible makes it clear that we are not going to undergo, undergo the great tribulation, that we will not undergo that. And God knows how to make sure that the righteous do go under that punishment, that trial, and the days of God's judgment. Revelation 3.10 says, Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I will also keep you from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon the world to try them that dwell on the earth. There will come a day when, when the Antichrist will come, when the wickedness of the world will come, when world prosperity will be given a, a whole new light. There will be a day when at the Lord's command, at the cry and the shout of Almighty God, there will be not one single Christian left on the earth for a time. Not one single believer will be on earth. All those who believe in God will be caught up to be with Christ in the air. Both the dead saints and those who are living. Now here's the question. Which one are you? 
Are you one of the ones that are undergo the wrath of God because of your rebellion, your pride, your disrespect, your dislove, your disloyalty, your hard heart? I don't believe it. You know what? I haven't seen it happen. The Bible tells us this. The goodness and kindness, the forbearance, the love of Almighty God should lead you to repentance. If He can be so gracious and kind as to not condemn you now as a sinner, how much wrath are you under? How much justice are you under? That's why Christ came. He said in, in Matthew and in Mark and in Luke and in John that He came to redeem fallen mankind. Those who would repent and believe in Him. Those who the Father calls to Him. He will not lose one. He will not cast you out. And you say, how do I know I'm of the number of the elect? Repent and believe the gospel. I don't know. Repent and believe the gospel. It is not up to you or me. I don't look for the yellow mark, as Spurgeon said, down your back. If that was the symbol, I would go looking. I go looking to call people to repent and believe the gospel of Jesus. Because there's coming a day when he's going to judge the world in righteousness. Now, do you know him? And are you ready to meet him? There's many more passages and many more things we can talk about. But I felt like in Luke, that was the salient thing that we needed to look at. As we talk about the rapture of the coming king, it is his rapture of his bride, the church. Trust in him and become part of the body and the bride of Christ. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we just want to come before you and exalt your name. To magnify you and to praise you and thank you for all of your mighty works. Lord, we know that you are going to come for us one day, and one day we are going to be with you in heaven for all of eternity, and we praise you and thank you for that day. Lord, we look forward to that day. Whether we die now and we meet with you and have that glorified eternal body, or whether we see you coming in the clouds and we get to go be with you, and we get to be with you and to exalt you and praise you, as, Lord, you establish your kingdom, as, as we, we experience the marriage supper of the Lamb, as we go through those many blessings, and as this world goes through the trials of the seven years of tribulation, Lord, we are ready, and we say, come, Lord Jesus. But until that day, Lord, we ask you to save souls. Bring souls into your kingdom, into your harvest. In Christ's name, amen. I want to thank you all for watching, for listening for paying attention and I apologize again for all the silly stuff that went on and the uh, uh, technical difficulties. It's part of the trials of being on the internet uh, doing it this way. So I want to thank you very much and God bless you.